So now let's do it the next step in FIR filter example. FIR filter example just to get an idea how this whole works. And so the example is an moving average. So moving average is just the following in terms of FIR terms. So we've got just one delay step. And so we're multiplying this output here by half and this here also by half. And these are very often called tubs, so like water tubs. So that's in the um, in this way here, halfway open. Okay, so after we've multiplied this with a factor half, we just add this up here and send this out. So that's our input signal x of n, and that's our output signal y of n. So if we just make a simple table with the time steps, the input and the output, then we can have a look, for example, how this whole system so that's time step 0, 2, 3, 4, 5 acts on a delta pulse. So a delta pulse in this case is just the 1 at x and then the rest is just 0. Yeah, so this is here, here a delta pulse. Delta pulse. So the one here is obviously directly showing up here, so we've gotten the first time step, the one here, and then this is here still zero, so this gives us just a half. So at the next time step, the x has become zero again, so we just write zero here, but then the one has progressed to this point here, so we're getting the half here. Yeah, so again, you get half now. So then the next time step here, then the 1 is obviously replaced again by 0, and the 0 here is a 0 again. So we are getting 0, 0, 0, and 0 again. So our impulse response is essentially half and half. So this way we can directly also write this down in our z-transform because we know that z2 minus 1 is a delay, so we can directly write half z2 minus 1 because this is our delay here. So the z2 minus 1 shows up here as this t here, and these are our factors here. So that's essentially z2, z2 0, um, and therefore it's 1, so it's just here the half and this is a half delayed by one time step. That's our transfer function here. Okay, so now, what is the frequency response of that? So, frequency response of our function h of z, which was or is half plus half z to minus 1. So we now, in order to create a frequency response, we just do e to j omega. Yeah, so this gives us in here half plus half to e to minus j omega. So we just need to basically now turn this into a nice form in order to see our frequency response here. So there, there we just, um, as a trick, we're trying, or the aim is to turn this into a real, into a real multiplied by a imaginary product 
because at the end we would like to calculate the absolute value of this. So in order to do this, so what we could just do is we do the trick here and write this the way that we are pulling out e2 minus half j omega out of this here and then just leave the rest here as e2 half j omega so this then gives 1 here again plus e2 minus half j omega yeah, so that we turn this into this just by pulling out this term here and so the idea behind this is that we know this is here 2 time cosine omega no, half omega, omega half. Let's do this this way. So then our result here is, so we've got a complex phase factor, E2 minus half J omega, and this is then multiplied by this cosine half omega. So now we've got a complex phasor here, and we've got uh, just the real part here. So this makes it now easy to calculate the amplitude response and also the phase factor of that. So let's do this. So let's write this down here again. So that's E2 J omega equals two E2 minus half J omega multiplied by cosine half omega. So this one here is real, and this is here just a phase factor. So therefore, if we want to now have the amplitude response, yeah, so just here the ups value of this, and this is obviously just this term here, cosine half omega, and then the then the phase depending on omega, is here just this argument here. So this is then minus half omega. So this is our phase factor here. And so then our group delay, so d phi divided by omega. So this is then our tau g and then this is obviously so our tau g is then just half so we've got constant group delay so let's just have a look on octave how this how this looks like so let's just plot our frequency response here. So which is just so let's create a vector from minus pi step width maybe 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 to pi. So that's our frequency omega here. And then we plot this just omega of cosine of half multiplied by omega. So let's have a look what this gives us here. So we're getting a response which looks like that. And this response is essentially a very, very simple low-pass filter. So we see we're getting maximum response for DC and we're getting maximum damping here for the highest frequency for the Nyquist frequency here. So let's drill down a bit more on the H of E to J omega equals to cosine of half omega. So let's just look at two scenarios here. A at the Nyquist frequency So that's omega equals pi because omega equals 2 pi u.5 in terms of normalized frequencies gives us pi. 
And then the other option is DC, and this is obviously just omega equals zero. So let's first have a look at the at the Nyquist frequency here. Okay, so A Nyquist frequency. Nyquist frequency omega is pi. So remember in our curve here, so this goes to zero. So this, this was our H here. This is our frequency omega. And so for pi, this FIR filter just suppresses this frequency completely. Yeah, so for for Nyquist, no output. So can we see this in our FIR filter? Remember, this is just multiplying this here by half our input signal and summing this up. So that's our x of n, that's our y of n. So what is Nyquist frequency? So if we look at the in the time domain or in the sample domain, Nyquist frequency means that we have this alternating samples here. So for example, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. So if we're feeding this here into our x of n here, then either we have here, for example, a 1 and a minus 1, which gives us 0, or we have a minus 1 and a 1, which also gives us 0. Yeah, so for, for the Nyquist frequency, so therefore we are getting 0 output here, and this is directly visible in our circuit diagram just by sending in this frequency into our FIR filter. So how is this for DC? Yeah, so again, let's draw this here again. So we've got the half and the half here. So that's our summation here. X and this is y of n and y of n. And this is our scenario B for DC. So how does it work for the DC? DC just means that this input here is constant. So xn is constant. Yeah, so for example, the xn of n could be just a line at 1. So obviously in this case our output is here just the 1 is multiplied, the 1 is here, the 1 is here is multiplied by half, so then the output is always 1. So this means dc is not affected and gives maximum output. And so this is what we, in summary, expecting. So if our response, so our response looked like this. So h of e two j omega. So that we're getting maximum response for DC and zero for Nyquist. So let's try this out now in MATLAB. Um, so what we do is we're just generating a random number sequence. Yeah, so random hundred comma one. So this gives us just random numbers, and the idea of random numbers is that all frequencies in theory should be in it here. So we have these random numbers here. I mean, we're creating this quite nasty jumps up and down. Obviously our averaging filter will eliminate some of these drastic jumps because they're corresponding to a very high frequency, some of them to our Nyquist frequency. So what we do is, so we are creating our averaging filter now. 
So that's done with that. And so now MATLAB has luckily a function which is doing exactly this. So that's a filter function. We're just giving it our impulse response. So one we just ignore. And then x is our input. So now let's plot the y. Or let's just do first another another figure that we see them both on screen. So figure two. And um, so now we do plot of y. So let's bring this also on the screen here and compare this. So we have now these two signals. This is the filtered signal here. This is the unfiltered signal. And so now, for example, if we look at this peak here, the original peak has this, there's, um, there's a slight dent here, where here this is gone, so that's smoothed out. It's the same with all these tiny jumps here. So they are all disappeared here and um, smoothed out. Okay, what is now obviously interesting is um, the frequency spectra of both of them. So if you first plot, if you go back to figure one, and now let's plot the um, frequency spectrum. Oops, FFT of X. Let's see what this gives us here. So now this is a frequency spectrum here of our signal X, so our input spectrum. And as I said, random sequence generates as more or less a flat frequency response here. Remember, this is up to here and then this is a mirror. So this here at the beginning is our DC because the, the random sequence only runs from 0 to 1 and so therefore we are getting the shift here. Okay, so now let's have a look at the other spectrum. Let's switch this to figure 2 and do a FFT of the output signal. Okay, so, so now we see this is our input signal, nice and flat. And so now here, here we see that the Nyquist frequency, what we have in the middle here, is strongly suppressed. So this goes to zero here. So we've got this cosine characteristic, what we what we expect. So that the cosine goes down like this here. And because the mirror is here, so it would just jump up and go up this, this way here. So what we see here is that the Nyquist frequency is nicely suppressed by our averaging filter here and that we are still getting maximum response at the DC here.